Good afternoon to one and all. Thank you very much for attending this. Uh, I, uh, we have an important subject to talk about today. I'd like to begin. It's on the state of democracy, and, and so it's very much on the minds of a great number of Americans today as it is on the minds of people around the world. There is no better quote to understand democracy's place in the world, I think, than, and, than from Fisher Ames, who is an early member of Congress for a Federalist Party who wanted to contrast the monarchy to a democracy. And he said, a monarchy is like a merchant ship. You go on board and ride with wind and tide and safety and elation, but by and by you strike a reef and go down. But democracy is like a raft. You never sink, but damn it, your feet are always in the water. <laughs> and isn't that the way we feel today? The uh, democracy around the world is, I, th I think over the last several years, if you look worldwide, uh, there is a growing sense that democracy is becoming inevitable. It's moving into places where we thought we might not see in our lifetime, but it also has become much more daunting to have an effective democracy than we thought 10 or 15 years ago. Now, our scholars today are all uh, students of the American democracy, and we're going to focus our conversation here in the beginning on our conditions here in the United States. Uh, but we will, if you want to raise questions about Europe or the Arab Spring or Japan, where democracies are you know, in trouble into varying, various degrees, uh, we'd be happy to respond to those. But we wanted to get started on the early conversation uh, with the United States. And we're going to ask each, uh, each of the three uh, members of the panel if they would to offer some overview for maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, and then I'll have a few questions and we're going to open this up to you. So save up your questions. Let me briefly introduce uh, the members of the, my, of the panel to my immediate left uh, is David Kennedy, an acclaimed historian uh, whose, whose book, Freedom from Fear, The American People in Depression and War, 1929-1945, as you will recall, won a Pulitzer Prize. He's been at Stanford for some four decades, as much as those of us on the East Coast would like to lure him to the other uh, to the Atlantic instead of the Pacific, uh, but uh, he is uh, he has been a wonderful speaker in a variety of forms around the world about American democracy. Uh, to his left is a rising up and coming uh, <laughs> a member of the Academy, Russ Muirhead, who is an associate professor at Dartmouth uh, and comes from a very different part of the country. Obviously, taught at Harvard before going on to Dartmouth. We hope he'll come back. But he teaches courses on American political thought and philosophic foundations of constitutional democracy. Currently finishing a book entitled, and I think this is where some of his comments may go, to a defense of party spirit. A defense of party spirit. At a time when so many are talking about bipartisanship, the contrarian. And finally, to, uh, to his left, uh, is Sandy Levinson, who is a, had, has for a long while been the Centennial Chair, the Garwood Centennial Chair, professor, and professor of Government and Law at the University of Texas, Austin, representing still another part of the country. Uh, he, he has been teaching at UT since 1980. Uh, he's got a number of books about the United States Constitution, many, many articles. His most recent book framed America's 51 constitutions. America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. I think that gives you some sense of where he may be going uh, with some of his opening comments. But first, David, let's turn to you. It's all, it, you you've been living in California now for these low, these many years. It's often been said that California represents the future. You know, that what happens, it happens first in California, then it happens all across the United States, then it happens across the world. Tell us about what you've learned living in California about democracy and what, we, what lessons we should take from the California experience. Well, David, as you began by quoting uh, Fisher Ames, I'm going to begin by quoting a noted Californian, Joan Didion, uh, who once said, things had better work out here because here beneath this immense bleached sky is where we run out of continent, <laughs> speaking of California. So, well, how's this democracy thing working out in my home state of California? Well, I'd argue not too well. For example, in the 1970s, uh, California had the fourth highest per pupil expenditures uh, for students in the K-12 system. Uh, California now ranks 40th. Uh, we have the second highest percentage of adults without a high school diploma. 
Uh, the recent uh, three out of the last four year drought uh, underscores the obsolescence of all kinds of public services in the state, not least of all uh, the hydrological infrastructure that brings drinking water to Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego and irrigation water to the Central Valley. Uh, California's uh, unemployment rate is uh, about 11 percent. That's uh, several percentage points higher than the national average. Uh, the 2010 census uh, pointed out to us that native born Americans for the first time in history are leaving the state. Uh, in fact, between 2004 and 2007, more people left California for Texas and Oklahoma than came to California in the Dust Bowl era. Wow. Uh, and in fact, in 2000, uh, because of the uh, reapportionment of congressional seats in 2010, uh, for the first time since 1850, California did not gain a congressional seat. Texas gained four. Uh, in 2009, California's state budget uh, allocated almost two times as many dollars for prisons than it did for higher education. And by some calculations, uh, my state has something on the order of one half a trillion dollars worth of unfunded public pension obligations hanging over it going forward. So I could go on with this list. Uh, actually, this I'm only hitting the highlights, uh, but a picture quickly emerges here of the once golden state <coughs> as a scene of a lot of social wreckage, political paralysis, economic calamity. We can't school our children, we can't protect our environment, pay our bills, repair our highways, keep water flowing, or even keep our citizens uh, in the state. So how did we get into this uh, fix? Well, there are a lot of explanations, but I want to come back at the end to this fabled matter of democracy. Uh, we have been, this has actually changed recently, but we have been one of only three states, the other two are Arkansas and Rhode Island, that has a requirement to pass the budget of a two-thirds vote in the legislature supermajority, and at the same time, a requirement of a two-thirds vote in both chambers of the legislature for any tax increase. Uh, we are a term limit state. Uh, we're also fiddling with that around the margins, but I think we've had term limits now for about a generation, and it's pretty clear to this observer anyway that, they have, that uh, term limits have materially contributed to the deprofessionalization of the legislature and the migrating of power to unelected staff and not least of all to well-informed lobbies. Uh, like many other states, uh, we have suffered from gerrymandering of uh, representational districts. We've had uh, a lot of non-competitive districts where party ownership of the seat doesn't change hands no matter who's running or what the state of affairs is. Uh, and of course we have this other matter and I want to dwell on this just for a moment. Uh, many states have it but we make more use of it than any other state and that is the popular initiative. Uh, the legislating and constitutionalizing of various matters uh, through the initiative process. We just passed the 100th anniversary of the initiative. It, was, it came into place in 1911. It was the great uh, brainchild and reform of a very notable California governor, Hiram Johnson. And here is what he said in 1911 about the effects of the initiative. He said, the initiative depends on our confidence in the people and their ability to govern. The opponents of direct election, however they may phrase their opposition, in reality believe that people cannot be trusted. On the other hand, those of us who espouse these measures do so because of our deep-rooted belief in popular government, not only in the right of the people to govern, but in their ability to govern. Very noble sentiments, and it got the initiative passed in 1911 as an artifact of our governance system, and how has it worked since then? Uh, between 1911 and 1978, when the most notorious of all uh, propositions, uh, Proposition 13, passed, changing the way we fund our school systems and uh, uh, assess real estate taxes, between 1911 and 1978, California passed 42 initiatives. In the single decade of the 1980s, we passed 45 initiatives. And in the 1990s, 62 initiatives. Uh, the uh, recently retired Chief Justice of the uh, California Supreme Court, Ron George, who may be here, he's sometimes at this event, uh, has recently been going around the state uh, trying to educate Californians about just how pernicious this system is. And he reminds people of some of the following facts. Uh, the United States Constitution, uh, which is 220 some years old, if we regard the Bill of Rights as an organic part of the original Constitution, which I think it's fair to do, uh, the U.S. Constitution has been amended 17 times since 1791. 
The California Constitution, which is 133 years old, passed in 1879, has been amended more than 500 times. Oh, so Ron George tells the story about when he clerked for the, whatever the Supreme Court, just, the U.S. Supreme Court justice was that he clerked for, that justice, as many justices, carried a copy of the U.S. Constitution in his jacket pocket and would take it out on demand to make a point. And Ron George said, when I became the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to carry around a copy of the California Constitution, but it's the size of a mid-sized phone book. It certainly won't fit in any pocket. I'd have to lug the thing around in a case of some kind, so I don't, uh, I don't do it. And then he concludes this uh, recital, and I'll conclude on this point, by referencing a, uh, an initiative that passed in two, two initiatives that passed in 2009. Uh, one of them overturned the Supreme Court ruling uh, that declared uh, same-sex marriages to be legal and constitutionally protected in California. A uh, popular initiative overturned that. And on the same day, another constitutional initiative constitutionalized the square footage that chickens were entitled to on poultry farms come on, come in the Central Valley. So as Ron on, George, come, I'm not kidding, I'm on. not making this. It's in the Constitution. It's in the California Constitution. Not a, it's not a statute, it's a constitutional provision. So as Ron George puts it, in one <laughs> the same day, uh, the voters of California stripped some of their fellow, fellow citizens of their constitutional right to marry whom they pleased and at the same time conferred constitutional rights on chickens. Uh, so this is an absurd but not altogether untypical result of the kind of hyper-democracy uh, in which we live. So I'll stop on that happy note. There, 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 there's a, a phrase that comes to mind attached to chicken that, <laughs> that, that describes what one, one is the, the suffix. You know, the, yeah, yeah, suffix, right. The, um, okay, so uh, let, me, let me just ask you briefly uh, this, this question. So bottom line. Whatever other ills American democracy has, you don't think that popular initiatives and direct democracy is the answer? Uh, in fact, at least, it's, it's not, at least not on the scale and on the model that California has them. Yeah. We have a very low threshold for qualifying an initiative for the ballot. Right. Uh, and we make it, it's a kind of a wide open proposition who can get behind any ballot initiative. Sometimes that's not very transparent who supported right. the initiative. So we have an initiative process that's really gone amok, I think. Well, uh, it's, it's, but, some would say that happened in Wisconsin uh, with yes, the recall. Well, that, that, yeah. that, that if you, there was one thing to have a recall in California, but if you start having recalls yeah, yeah. every time you turn around, I think that many in, who sponsor the recall now think it was a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So I'm not against all popular uh, referendum and initiative uh, matters, but the, I'm against the one, the, the, one, the, the way yeah. we do it. I just have one other t the small question. You did have a change recently which opened up primaries, so they're open primaries. And so that people don't have to run as a Democrat or Republican, they can run as a citizen with a letter after their name. How is that working out? Is, yeah. is that promising? This, uh, there are two initiatives that passed recently, yeah. initiatives that passed recently. This is one of the ironies of this whole matter, that reformers today are using the initiative process to try to contain some of the popular uh, initiative damage that's been done in the last century. But one of them changed our primary system, so it's now a so-called top two system. Right. It's an open primary, the top two finishers face off in the general election. They could be, probably some of them will be of the same party, in fact. This is supposed to induce more centrism in right. the recruitment of candidates and in the, uh, the, the population of the legislature. Uh, and we've also just recently changed the uh, two-thirds requirement for passage of the budget. The budget can now be passed with simple majority. Again, it remains to be seen exactly how this is going to work out. It hasn't had much opportunity to display itself in practice. Mm -hmm. But we're hopeful this is going to introduce a little bit more system and rationality Good. to our system. Okay. Good. Well, let's talk, turn to you, Sandy, uh, because you you have written. I think. Uh, uh, well, you, you can tell you can tell us what you've written, but I think you you uh, go. You have a somewhat different view. Let's put it that yes, way. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Let me begin uh, with a comment from a column by Tom Friedman on this past April twenty second in which he, as he is doing now almost obsessively, focuses on the dysfunctionality of the American national political system. And he concluded the column by saying, does America need an Arab Spring? His answer was basically yes. Quote, we can't be great as long as we remain a vitocracy rather than a democracy. Our deformed political system with a Congress that's become a forum for legalized bribery is now truly holding us back, um, unquote. Um, 
I basically agree with Friedman's obsession that the American national government, and for that matter, the California state government, I don't have any argument uh, with David on that, um, are dysfunctional. Where what disappoints me about Friedman and the wide number of pundits across the political spectrum, uh, uh, you know, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein have recently published a book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. Um, what disappoints me is that almost all of these critiques, there are few fleeting exceptions, never take into account the role that the US Constitution plays in the dysfunctionality. It's as if we have the political system we do independently of decisions made in 1787 and to a remarkable degree left unchanged since 1787. My view is that some of our dysfunctionality, let me be very clear about this, um, I wear two hats, one of them is a political scientist. I do not believe that the Constitution explains everything that's wrong with the United States any more than I think it makes any sense to say that the Constitution explains everything that's right with the United States. I do believe that there are aspects of the United States Constitution that really are a clear and present danger, to coin a phrase, and that it is more than past time for people like Friedman and other critics of the current national system to realize that some of this has to do with decisions made in 1787. Um, let me focus on you know, what I assume is the greatest speech in American history, that is the Gettysburg Address. We'll be celebrating its 150th anniversary next year. And of course, Lincoln concludes by talking about the importance of government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now those are three really very different terms. You can have government for the people with a benevolent despot. Um, and indeed, you know, in the 18th century, benevolent despotism was a working theory of politics. Uh, what you want to do is try to locate somebody who is really disinterested and willing to make decisions that will serve the public good. So government for the people uh, in no way implies democracy. It can, but it, it, there's no logical entailment. Government of the people is a little bit trickier, but there it is that the people running the show should come from the people rather, say, than from an aristocratic class. And one of the great things about the Constitution, there are some things I like about the Constitution, the Titles and Nobility Clause is one of them. Uh, we don't think about it very much, but actually it was important that the Constitution bars the national government and the state governments from naming anybody dukes and earls. And we're all the equals of one another at a formal political level, which is as it should be in a democratic political order, but that simply says whoever holds power should be part of the demos. It says nothing about accountability. Then we get to government by the people. And that's really where I think David and I might have some disagreement. Um, and here, if you look at the 1787 Constitution, you discover that the framers were not fans of government by the people. This was not a group that would have viewed itself as democratic. They were, and these are little d, little r. Uh, this has nothing to do with the contemporary Republican Democratic parties. They really did believe in a Republican form of government. That's what the Constitution says. Every state is uh, guaranteed a Republican form of government, but that's in contrast to a dangerous democratic form of government. So just listen to two of the principal founders, two of the three uh, co-authors of the Federalist Papers. Uh, in the 63rd Federalist Paper, James Madison defends representative government, and that's really what Hiram Johnson, the debate about Hiram Johnson was about. He defends representative government precisely because of its, quote, total exclusion of the people in their collective capacity from any share, unquote, in the making of political decisions. 
it's all going to be made through representatives. Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, told um, uh, his fellow delegates um, in uh, Philadelphia, he, uh, Hamilton scoffed, some people have suggested that the people are the voice of God. And however generally this maxim has been quoted and believed, it is not true in fact. The people are turbulent and changing. They seldom judge or determine right, unquote. That is the mindset of 1787. Now, from this point, I could go off in at least two directions. One is to point out that if you look at almost every national constitution of what we would like to view as our peer countries around the world, each and every one of them is more democratic than ours. But some of you may believe in American exceptionalism or take Antonin Scalia's view that we have nothing to learn from anything that's ever been done outside of the United States. So that's why my new book has the subtitle it does. There are 51 constitutions in the United States, not only one, and if you look at the 50 state constitutions, you discover that each and every one of them is more democratic than is the United States Constitution. Indeed, David can correct me if he thinks I'm wrong on this. I think that 1787-88 is the last possible moment that you had enough elite legitimacy to get a national constitution proposed and ratified that is as undemocratic as the US Constitution. By the early 19th century, you have a spate of constitutional reform, not in California, which obviously doesn't exist yet, at least as far as the United States, but in New York, in a number of other states, and uh, there are lots of reforms including the New York Constitution, the people of New York, every 20 years, I think it is, are given the opportunity to vote on whether to have a new state constitutional convention. Ohioans this year will vote on whether or not to have a new constitutional convention. Uh, perhaps if there's more time, I can elaborate a number of ways. Each and every one of the state constitutions is easier to amend than the US Constitution, which is the most difficult to amend constitution in the known universe. I don't regard it as a good thing that we've had only 17 formal amendments since 1788. Because I mean, those of you who are in business know that it is likely that over a 200 year period, you might have to change aspects of your business plan. Um, um, and we don't do that at the national level. Now, some people might say, well, who really cares if it's democratic or not? I, my previous book was called Our Undemocratic Constitution, and what I discovered is that a lot of people would come up to me and say, either politely or condescendingly, don't you realize Professor Levinson, often they were citing James Madison, we weren't meant to be a democracy, we're meant to be a republic, and let's keep it that way. So there's an interesting schizophrenia among the American public. If you talk about the national constitution, people are scared stiff of democracy. But if you look at the state constitutions, you find a lot more democracy. Now, at one level, this is simply a debate among, among political theorists. Who cares? The real question is, do the sclerotic institutions of the national government or different kinds of problematic institutions that you have in California lead to worse outcomes that make people withdraw their support from the government, not on abstract political theory grounds, but because they believe government is not serving them. Today, the support for Congress is, some, depending on the day the poll is taken, is somewhere between 12 and 20%. The presidency, I think, is also somewhere in the 30s. The Supreme Court, astonishingly, is now below 50%. My hunch, and I mean this quite seriously, is that if there had been public opinion polls taken in America in 1775, you would have had at least that much support for the government of His Majesty King George III as 
you have today for basic governmental institutions. And there is this withdrawal of support because people feel altogether correctly that national political institutions, state political institutions as in California, are not responsive to the issues that we're confronting. Very last point I'll make and I'll stop. I always tell my students that the most sagacious political philosopher is Goldilocks because <laughs> there are no perfect systems of government. You're always going to be faced with too hot suggestions and too cold and we're always looking for the just right. Now, I agree with David that California is too hot, but I think that there's a real problem by focusing on what political scientists would call the N of one, because Oregon and Washington also have direct democracy. Um, I forget the exact number, but it's in the teens or low 20s, and 49 of the 50 states have at least some element of direct democracy. Maine has direct democracy, and usually don't point at Maine as a wild and crazy state. So we really ought to realize that as interesting as California is, we really can't generalize completely about any and all forms of direct democracy from the experience of California. But I'll concede, as I say, that California is too hot. I think that the United States government created in 1787 by people who were fundamentally mistrustful of the capacity of ordinary people to participate in government is way too cold. And it's more than past time for Tom Friedman and others to recognize that our present discontents have something to do with the decisions that were made 225 years ago. Thank you, that's a very interesting, but let me just put this question to you. If we then had referendums in the United States, we could have had on health care, mm -hmm. but let's say you had a referendum on various, uh, on Medicare and, and Medicaid and Social Security, uh, and clearly people would vote for robust programs, mm -hmm. expensive programs, and then you also had a referendum asking them, would you like to pay taxes, higher taxes, mm -hmm. and they would, they would say no in a very loud voice. I mean, there is this tendency for you know, as I think Russell Long once said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to do what it takes to get there. The, uh, I mean, is there that issue then that comes no, up? I think it's a completely fair question, but I think that where this leads to, quite frankly, is not merely skepticism about direct democracy, but skepticism about elections, because the kind of pathology that you've just described is present in our Congress. <clears throat> And, you know, it passes programs and doesn't want to pay for them. Right. And so, you know, I think the most fundamental question, you know, to go back to the Friedman column, what do we think the Arab Spring ought to portend in terms of what democracy would really mean there, given basic assumptions about the fitness of people to rule? Uh, but I think that's true whether you're talking about direct democracy or electoral democracy. Good. Terrific. Uh, and we'll, Dave, we'll have a chance to come back because, uh, to, to let you two engage uh, more. But I do want to turn to get Russ into the conversation, if we could, uh, on a question of party spirit. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, I, listening to these great presentations, I, I have a question that reflects on my presentation for each of my pe fellow panelists saying, Sandy, I wondered, would you, would you like a constitution that empowers parties or a constitution that restrains parties and, and David would California be better off if somehow he could peel away the partisanship in the way that the top two primary promises to do because my hunch is that though we tend to blame uh, we, the, the, the pathologies of American politics in the moment on an excess of, of, party, of party spirit on partisanship that is petty self-defeating, unnecessarily divisive. I think what, what a well-functioning democracy depends on isn't less partisanship, but better partisanship. <laughs> I, I, I think that we do, in fact, our, our disagreements aren't false 
things imposed on the polity by ambitious politicians trying to get elected. They have roots in the society and in our understandings and our disagreements about the common good. And, and, and I think we've, as a polity, been evading some fundamental questions over the previous decade that we won't be able to escape over the next decade. And that the best way to engage these is to engage at a deeper level than our politicians normally do, the, the disagreement about the common good and the values that inform it, that in fact marks the country. The Republican Party, in general, wants to vest responsibility in each person for dealing with their bad decisions and bad luck, and wants to allow each individual to enjoy the consequences of their good decisions and good luck. And the Democratic Party, by contrast, says that we should stand together and ensure each other against some of the, the worst consequences of our bad luck. And, and that we should stand together and try to provide opportunities for children in spite of the bad decisions and bad luck that their parents made or, or, or suffered. Those are different conceptions of, uh, of the common good. And, and I think our democracy would be healthier and, 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 and more vital, no less frustrating and no less divisive, but, but healthier if we engaged those differences more directly. So, so how do you, what does that mean by healthier? Um, I think in, instead of um, a partisanship that, a low partisanship that focuses on, on what's um, in the short-term electoral interest of a particular party, the kind of partisanship we see when a party leader in, in, in the Senate says our, the number one goal of our party is defeating the president at the next election. Um, we would stand face to face with the, with the values and the conceptions of the common good that, that a lot of us are sort of ambivalent about. We're, we're divided within, not just in the society. And, and we would, I think, have the chance to come to a more informed and deliberate opinion about the common good. That's what I mean by health here. If, and I think actually from an electoral point of view, the parties would, would be more successful if they engaged um, the, the ideals that inform their, their, their organizations. I think, for instance, the White House would be much more successful if it spoke about um, the, the broad values that inform the Affordable Care Act 2010. You know, David, go ahead, please. It's hard to disagree with that. Uh, and what you're describing is a uh, kind of political behavior that was characteristic of another era. And mm -hmm. I suppose the question is, can we recapture the operating principles of that era? And I hesitate to do this in the presence of two political scientists and constitutional scholars, but we could take this issue all the way back to Federalist uh, Number 10, the most famous of the Federalist Papers, where you remember James Madison worries about the effects of faction, about difference in the body politic. And he worries about the danger of factions emerging that will be so irreconcilably opposed that they'll paralyze the whole system. He did not envision parties the way we understand them. They were largely unknown at that time, but he envisioned something called faction. Uh, and his remedy for this was not some mechanical uh, remedy, but the sheer scope of the republic, its scale, its diversity would impede the formation of permanently entrenched factions that would just simply refuse to do business with the other side. There'd be constantly shifting coalitions and so forth. And many of the people in this room looking around at the demographic of the audience, I think, uh, probably grew up in the same era that I did when we learned in our civics class that the problem of, of faction had been solved in our time with the emergence of two political parties that were, to use the phrase that we all learned back then, catch-all parties. They were parties that were so diverse in their bases and in their constituencies and so on that all kinds of negotiating went on inside each party so that by the time they came to confront the other party, party they were standing more or less in the middle of the spectrum, both of them. Uh, it, 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 uh, Sandy referenced uh, Norm Ornstein's and Thomas Mann's new book, uh, there was a little bit of possibility of confusion there when you referred to it. You said it's even worse than it looks. That's not a description of the book. That's the title of the book. <laughs> it's not, not, a, not a reviewer's judgment. It's, it's the title of the book. And I, I commend it to you. I'm about a third of the way through it as of this morning. Uh, and they make a point in there that I think is quite arresting. And it goes back to points of the, the two points that you've made about, on the one hand, political parties, the other constitutional system. Uh, they say at the core of a lot of our present difficulty is that we have now evolved parliamentary style political parties 
that are very disciplined. And indeed, one of the things that you have to admire about the Republican Party in the last three years is that the degree to which it has maintained its party discipline, kept everybody on the reservation, even when I imagine some of them might have been tempted to do business otherwise. You, but we have you a, think it's salutary? Well, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not, as a political yeah. achievement, I think it's something to remark. But they, with their description is we have a parliamentary party system in a constitutional system of checks and balances. And this is a, com a convergence that's really from hell. Yeah. yeah, let me, let's tie together so I make sure I understand where you're coming from. Sandy makes the argument, we ought to have more direct democracy. The people ought to have a chance to speak more often. We wouldn't want to go as far as California, but something short of that would be healthy. It might help to break open the gridlock. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, again, this is a practical matter. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, a, 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 well, let me back up. Having seen the damage that a runaway referendum initiative system has done in California, it's hard for me to imagine this working in any practical way at the national level. And I'm reminded of a constitutional amendment that was proposed in the 1930s that when I describe it to you, you will see it's uh, almost by definition unworkable. It was associated with a representative by the name of Lewis Ludlow the height of the isolationist moment in the 1930s, he proposed a constitutional amendment that would require a national referendum to declare war, to take the war-making power out of the hands of the Congress, put it directly in the hands of the people. Uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg said at the time it would be as sensible to require a meeting of the town council before authorizing the fire department to put out a fire. I mean, that, that's yeah. an, again, it's an extreme example. Uh, but it, uh, we'd want to start distinguishing that kind of clearly impractical example about what subjects we would want to be accessible by national referendum uh, from those that we thought wouldn't yeah, be such a good let me idea. Pick up on that for a moment because one of the realities is that Congress, either through willful abdication or simply the press of development since World War II, has basically given up or lost the power to declare war. So this is one of the many unilateral powers of presidents, whether they're Democratic or Republican presidents. Uh, we could talk about uh, the Bush administration, we could talk about the Obama administration, we could talk about the Clinton administration, it doesn't matter. Um, and so I think that this is what, I, I would like a new National Constitutional Convention, not because I have a magic constitution in my pocket, but because this is one of the things we don't really talk about, that is what kind of forms of government might be appropriate to the very different world we live in. You and I agree completely that James Madison was living in a fantasy world in believing that we could escape government by factions. And then the question is indeed, um, you know, what, how might you organize a polity where you have highly ideological political parties, uh, you don't have a separation of power system where you can have so-called divided government. I don't like Mitch McConnell, but I think he's being completely and utterly rational. It is important who becomes president, given the powers of the modern presidency, given that at the national level, unlike the state level, the winner of the presidential election is winner take all. In Texas, where I'm from, the governor of Texas gets to appoint very few people because we elect almost everybody else. In California, you elect the governor, but you also elect the attorney general, the commissioner of insurance, and so on and so forth. At the national level, whoever is president gets to name everybody. Mitch McConnell, I believe, rationally and correctly believes that Ted Kennedy elected George Bush in 2004 by being a public-spirited compromiser and giving Bush no child left behind and the prescription drug bill. And I don't hold it against McConnell simply from my perspective as a political scientist that he says, we're not going to do that again. So he wants to deprive Barack Obama of anything that he could count as an accomplishment in order to defeat him in 2012. Now, if we had a more parliamentary system, then it wouldn't matter that you had two highly ideological political parties, one of whom is devoted to defeating the other in the next election, but it cannot stymie and gridlock the way the framers 
the way you can at the national level, courtesy of decisions made in 1787 under assumptions that were no longer true even in 1800, do let think, alone. Do you think that there's today. some reason to believe that our separation of powers constitution will teach contemporary partisan, partisans the art of compromise you know, after the next election? Because they'll have the choice, as Ted Kennedy did in 2002 and 2003, between getting nothing and getting yeah. something. If Barack, and what Obama, motivates if Barack Obama, Obama wins, to get something instead of nothing. then the Republicans might have an incentive to engage in moderate compromise, because he can't run again in 2016. But if, George, if Mitt Romney wins, then I would predict, and quite frankly, as a partisan Democrat, I would hope they would do nothing <laughs> to encourage his prospects of re-election in 2016. Why should they? <laughs> this, uh, I, was, I was with you for part of this argument. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, uh, one of the fathers of uh, American political science, one of the iconic figures of American political science was Robert Dahl. Uh, who had enormous influence, I'm sure, on everyone on this stage. And he argued, much as Sandy has argued, that we ought to have more direct democracy, that the Constitution, that Madison had a flawed conception of how to, how to govern, we ought to change it. That, that argument actually has some antecedents that are, you know, that are very strong. What I find astonishing is that you have really bought into the notion that we ought to have a parliamentary democracy in a, in a, in a, in a republic. Uh, because it so clearly doesn't work. I mean, isn't the problem to a significant degree that the political culture has changed, changed dramatically so that if your argument Everett Dirksen should not have joined in in 1964 in the Civil Rights Act to get that passed, get some Republicans to pass it, because he did not, he wanted to do everything he could to make sure Lyndon Johnson didn't minimize his victory in 64. Is that really what you believe? No, but it was, that was a, a completely different era, and we have to... Um, you know, to, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, we have to design a political system for the political culture we've got, rather than a political culture we wish we had had. Now I have to say, going back, I entered graduate school at Harvard 50 years ago this September, astonishingly enough to me, and one of the debates in political science then, and I think it's still a debate today, is the relative importance of institutions as against culture. Right. Um, the, from my perspective, the strongest critique of my argument, incidentally, just to be clear, although it is true that I support some elements of direct democracy, I also support institutional changes that have nothing to do yeah. with direct democracy. But, you know, is California's problem that they have a bad set of political institutions, including the initiative and referendum for constitutional conventions, which might, constitutional amendments which might be true, or is the problem that California, with all due respect, has a wacko culture? Because you look just north. Where's the respect? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's admitting that it's a culture. Right. Yeah, go ahead. They, you, you look just north of California at, Ohio, at uh, Oregon and Washington, which have much the same set of institutions, and we don't go around talking about the pathologies of Washington, and there's the adjoining state to uh, Russ and Maine, and people just don't go around saying those wacko, uh, I don't know what, Mainers, maniacs, Mania. whatever. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah let me, let me, let me uh, uh, if I could, uh, alter the direction a little bit in the conversation and to come back to the cultural point because on the minds of many people here uh, are two thoughts that even if, even if people in parties wanted to be responsible, even if you had more people uh, coming into the Senate, that we now have a media culture and we have a money culture which make it very, very difficult for people to uh, to come together and to try to govern, you know, take Olympia Snow, who just, who just left, was leaving in frustration. Uh, I've talked to her about this, and there have been many an occasion when she's been called during the middle of the week and asked, "Would you come on a Sunday chat show, and and argue on the, for the Republican point of view and that?" And then and she'll say yes, and the next day she'll get a call from a producer and say, "Okay, we'd like to talk through. You're going to here's the here's your Democratic counterpart. What would you like to say?" 
what, can we pre-interview you? And she said, sure. And then she says, look, I very much respect that other person. I think we can find common ground on the following three issues. I think we can do some very constructive things and here and here, and it's really time we come together. And the next day she gets a call saying, you're canceled. And they put on two firebrands from each party. Now, that is what is occurring to a considerable extent. Mm -hmm. You couldn't put this conversation on the air or much of what's been going on at, this, at the Aspen Ideas Festival. You might get it on C-SPAN and maybe, yes, some tel public television, but most of this you couldn't get into the normal political discourse uh, uh, that goes on in cable or, or the over-the-air networks. Yeah. Uh, and the other part is the money. You know, which we've got a runaway system now under the constitutional, under a constitutional ruling. How do we deal with those problems? How, are they as serious as I'm describing, and how do we get out of them? You know, I, I think you're right, but go back to Dirksen and the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. The fact is that that was the old party system where the Democratic Party was split between liberals and Southern white racists, and Lyndon John and the Republican Party in turn was fiscally conservative, and there were a whole bunch right. of people who were very progressive on right. race. Lyndon Johnson, to his eternal credit, destroyed that American party system when he signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that's what's led to the more right. ideologically so, unified so, and divisive I mean, quite, quite frankly, yes. the, the Republican Party, beginning with the Southern strategy in 1968, has systematically tried to attract the segregationists from the former Democratic Party, has done so very successfully, um, and that is, I think, the basics that um, uh, wait, 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 in American wait. politics today. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. I, I hope you're not making the argument that the Republican Party is a segregationist party and is driven by race, and that's what's really No, the Republican us. Party today is very much tilted to the South. And the Southern Republicans are, by and large, not racial progressives. Well, we, we, can, have, we can have big disagreements about that. I, I, I just want to register for the record that a lot of us would disagree with that pretty strenuously. But I want to come back to the question of money and the press, and I mean, where I, you, I, David, or, or please, Russ. Yeah, I, I think the, the, for there to be vigorous and constructive partisan contestation, right. there needs to be some institutions in our political intellectual life that are, that are in fact, nonpartisan, that, that secure, for instance, the integrity of facts. Right. And a nonpartisan academy and a nonpartisan media Mm -hmm. are absolutely essential to that. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, the rise of the, of the partisan media that has no respect for, for, for fact as a, as a possible thing we could ever know is very troubling. Well, mm -hmm. I might just add that. Uh, Tom Edsel had a piece in the New York Times last month or so uh, in which there was a graphic about who reads what across the liberal to conservative spectrum, where is readership and listenership concentrated. And it was very, very clear that uh, what I'm going to say most people in this room read the New York Times and the Washington Post, and at the other end of the spectrum, people read only the Wall Street Journalist and the Fox News. So it, it's not just the partisanship in the media, it's, it's the, the segmentation of the media right. that people can now pick and choose from amongst many, many, many different news outlets, and they tend to read, we all do, it's just natural, to read those uh, outlets that more or less confirm our view of the world. There's a psychological term for it, it's called confirmation bias. And the proliferation of the media has made this possible to a degree that was never uh, true before. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, again, a generation or so back, uh, Walter Cronkite's news broadcast had a Nielsen rating of something like 29%, meaning all of all the households had their television on at that time. 29% were watching Uncle Walter, and uh, they were all getting a view of the world that they shared. Uh, they might not have agreed with every bit of it, but that's what they were getting. Uh, if I remember this correctly, the, the, the highest Nielsen rating for any show today, and I think the program is American Idol, is about 9%. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've just scattered readership and listenership and viewership over a great big spectrum, and people, all of us, and again, we shouldn't get snooty about this, I, all of us just read those outlets or those uh, that, programs that tend to reinforce our view. That observation make, makes me think of, of this, what I think of as a kind of fundamental point about democracy, where you know, democracy is where the people rule, government by the people. But the people aren't naturally uh, as one. They're, they're actually infinitely fragmented. 
Uh, we each disagree with every other person in the room on, on something. We're infinitely fragmented in our opinion. And look at the Iraqi parliament after Iraq goes democratic. They, it spends an entire year trying to get a majority that can, that can run the show in parliament. Can't do it. It's very, very hard to get people to stand together for any length of time. And, uh, and it, yeah. that's our natural condition. That's what our institutions and our constitutions have to somehow enable us to do. I, I'd love, before we finish this, if you all could just uh, uh, answer the question, where have the statesmen gone? Where have the leaders gone? But I want to, I want to go to the floor. Maybe you can wind that in as we go. Uh, I'm going to cold call. Tom Friedman actually is here. Uh, and uh, since your name was invoked, Tom, uh, I, 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 if I could cold you call on you, that would be terrific. Are we just walking on the path? Like <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I didn't hear Professor Levinson's uh, initial remark, but I think I got the drift. And, um, <laughs> uh, and so let me, let me just really pick up on it. And um, uh, I totally agree with the, what the panel has said, that the parties have been We've lost uh, Northern liberals from the Republican Party. We've lost Southern Democrats from the Democrat, from the uh, uh, Southerners from the Democratic Party, with Northern liberals from the Republican Party. So they are two uniform parties, uh, ideologically uniform, of a much more parliamentary nature. And to me, uh, the answer to that is when you have two such ideologically driven parties in a constitutional system of what we have, how, how do you change that? How do you get around that? What well, seems to me the frustration we've been living with is this endless gridlock that is becoming more and more rancid, um, personal, toxic, and paralyzing. And my answer to that has been a third party. A third party to do what? Uh, to actually bring out the fact that we have basically a far left and far right party. And you can say maybe the public party's moved farther right than the Democratic Party has moved farther left. But on balance, each one is more to the extreme than the other in a center left, center right country. And what that says to me is the actual core of this country, which is center left, center right, in my view, not just because I'm from Minnesota, I really believe that, okay, is basically unrepresented. At some deep level right now, unrepresented. And I think the way you actually break this gridlock is by having someone identify that centrist block and bring them into the political process. And my criticism of President Obama after the grand bargain failed was why didn't you go to the country? If this grand bargain was important enough for you to, to negotiate with John Boehner secretly for months, why didn't you go to the country? Say, this is what we were talking about. This is the world we live in. This is why this grand bargain will solve the problem. And leverage the country against the Republicans who were standing against it. Now you can say, well, that's not realistic. Or really, what happened on the payroll tax issue? Did you follow that debate? Obama called out Republicans who were going to block the uh, extension of the payroll tax cut. It took about two weeks of polls to show the Republican Party that the country, that center left, center right, was totally against them. They folded like that. And the problem today, it seems to me, is the president has invested his whole agenda in the most partisan, paralyzed institution of the country, and the last time he leveraged the American people was the day he got elected. And somebody should start to actually, if we had someone, a Ross Perot, and let's remember Ross Perot had 40% of the vote at one point. He won 20% of the vote, and he was nuts, okay? <laughs> so, so imagine, Imagine if a Michael Bloomberg were there, and you said something I thought very important, Sam. You said um, uh, that the, these are only, oh no, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I didn't, because I came in late in the, in the. Russ. Russ, I'm sorry, Russ. So um, I thought you said something really important, which was that um, we've only got these kind of, we've got low partisanship. That's a really good point. It's just about I want to win over you. It, and what we need is high partisanship. Yeah. And to me, what a third party would force is to say to each one, now what is your real position? Because this is, I think, the real position in the country. It would force high partisanship rather than low partisanship. I'll now go back to my height, but thank you very yeah, much. Tom, <laughs> thank you. If I, if I could just say something about your advocacy of a third party, and this goes back to David Gergen's question about where are the leaders. Uh, you gave a puff in one of your columns several months back to Americans elect. 
as a possible grassroots, digitally-based movement that might emerge as a third party. They're now out of business, and they're out of business not least of all because they could not recruit a candidate who would be willing to be nominated uh, by that process. So th these things converge. Well, but there, there's another problem. This is like a Marshall McLuhan moment, of course, uh, in the Woody Allen movie, that, I mean, we could, if there were time, we could talk about President Obama. The reason I disagreed strongly with your third party strategy is something you never brought up in your columns, which is the crazy electoral college. And the fact is we had strong third parties in 1948 and 1968 with two southern racists, a relatively few votes in a few states would have thrown those elections into the House of Representatives where one of the craziest of the constitutional rules is one state, one vote. So Wyoming, California, Vermont, in Texas, uh, you know, as a Democrat, I'm delighted that Pat Leahy and Bernie Sanders would cancel out K. Bailey Hutchins and John Cornyn, but as a little D Democrat, I think that makes no sense. And I think that you were assuming that you could have a third party that would not possibly cause egregious mischief because of this basic constitutional uh, rule. The third party or fourth party gave us Abraham Lincoln in 1868. Well, great, but Abraham Lincoln had 39.8% of the popular vote and his election triggered civil war. Now, you might say again, great, because it got rid of slavery and that would get us into another discussion of if it, were, if it was worth a war to get rid of slavery, then why should the 1787 Constitution have been ratified yeah. in the first place? But I really do wish you would at some point talk about the institutional structures within which American politics take place, because I agree with so much of your diagnosis so, otherwise. Sometimes, in a related <laughs> point, sometimes I wonder if, I, I wonder, I don't know if this is true, whether our politics might be more centrist than it looks through the lens of this, especially the partisan media. And I look at the Obama administration. Uh, this president kept the Secretary of Defense from his predecessor mm -hmm. and from the opposing party. I don't know if you can find a president who kept the opposing party's Secretary of Defense throughout his first term and pursued a strategy arguably identical to the one that Bush would have pursued, roughly identical to the one that Bush would have pursued in Iraq and Afghanistan, though he was supported by an anti-war constituency within his own party. He continued the economic pol bailout policy of his predecessor, Secretary of the Treasury. Um, he also passed his party's uh, the, uh, a, a health care bill that reflected the, the number one goal of his party, as it had been clearly defined in the primaries. So he acted like a partisan, On, perhaps betraying the policies. center in some the mandate. But he's also <laughs> very centrist. And we don't, well, I don't think he gets much credit for, for his yeah. centrism. He deserves a little more than he gets. <laughs> we could have a lot of arguments. Okay, who else here? Yeah, Tom, do you want to come back in? Look, with a third, with, with a third party, I can make the same argument to you. Say, you know, you're afraid of a third party because you don't want to elect the wrong person, and that, yep. believe me, I have the same concern. Um, which is why, basically, one of the points I made is it'd be really great if we had a third party who actually just participated in the debates and dropped out. You know, um, uh, to, seriously, to actually change the debate. You know. Um, but I think one could argue, Ross Perot, look, uh, uh, Bob Rubin has made this point. Ross Perot made Bill Clinton a deficit reducer. Mm -hmm. That's right. One That's could right. argue that Teddy Roosevelt, you know, laid the basis for the progressive era of Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. So I can give you as many cases where this goes off the rails as where it really has a significant impact in bringing the right values to the next president that a third party is there not to win but to sting and then to die, but sting in a really important way. If, if I'd like to, if, uh, we've got to have someone else who's been very influential in these conversations. E.J. Dion is here, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I now wants to make a comment. Yeah, I just want to uh, respond to one thing my friend Tom said. By the way, I love Tom, and one of the privileges of my life was working with him in Beirut. So, I'm, But I, there's one thing you said that I think that I'd like to challenge you, which is this notion that you have a far-right Republican Party and a far-left Democratic Party. That's just not true, I think. What you have, if you look at the polling at the moment, 
about two-thirds of Republicans, and it's been growing steadily over the years, now call themselves conservative. If you look at Democrats, they are split 50-50 between moderates and conservatives. If, this were, if the Democrats were a far-left party, we would have passed single payer or at least a public option, not John Chafee's health plan. Uh, if the Democrats were a far left party, Dodd Frank would have been a lot tougher. If the Democrats were a far left party, a third of the stimulus would not have been in tax cuts. And I think the core reason Americans elect failed, and on this I don't think Tom disagrees with me entirely, the, one of the reasons Americans elect uh, failed, and there were many, is that President Obama is far more a centrist than he is a liberal. Uh, if you look at, his, at what he's done uh, in office, if you look at his budgets, if you look at the deal he was willing to make uh, with John Boehner, so that I agree with my friends Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein that what we're dealing with here is asymmetric polarization, that our Republican friends have moved farther toward the right than the Democrats have moved uh, toward the left. And I think that's got to be, um, you know, and we could debate that, but I think there's a lot of factual evidence uh, for that. I, I think it's very hard to debate that point. <laughs> <laughs> we guys, we put you guys up here on the stage if you'd like. You know. <laughs> EJ, I agree with you on the percentages. The, the Republican Party has demonstrably moved farther right than the Democratic Party has moved left. I know, to me, the, the question that Mann and Ornstein don't answer is why are they getting away with it? Yeah. They don't answer that question. Why have they gotten away with it? And that's where I come back to the point where the president hasn't, I think, leveraged the public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason they haven't gotten away with it is people haven't called them on it because too much of the discussion is this kind of mamby-pamby discussion. They're all yeah. alike. They're all polarized. And I think we need to face that fact and move on from there because I mourn the decline of moderate republicanism in this book I'm going to talk about later. It's the only book you'll ever read that has 10 pages on Jacob Javits in it. Uh, and I think there were a lot of people in the Republican Party who used to stand for a kind of moderation or progressivism. Uh, who aren't there anymore, and Mike Castle losing a primary to Christine O'Donnell. I mean, you have a lot of examples of this that I think are very yeah. disturbing for our uh, republic. But uh, thank you for making that uh, point. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I just want to say one thing. EJ, I agree with you, on, especially on the moderate republicanism. I also agree with you, basically. I think Obama is more centrist than the country realizes. But it's been quite striking to me, if you look at some of these surveys asking people, where do you stand? On, the, on an ideological spectrum, where does Obama stand, where do the Republicans stand, and the country is to the right of center and feels that Obama is well to the left of center and that the Republican Party is actually closer to where they stand than Obama does. And that, that has been quite surprising to me and interesting to me through that, throughout this because the perception of Obama is much more to the left, even though the arguments I think that the two of you are citing uh, bring a lot of weight to the other the other perspective. And well, I think I, if, I, if uh, I, okay. Mitt Romney is elected, the Republican Party will have to moderate. Um, it, if, if he, the, he will govern. He'll, if, if he wants to be reelected, he'll have to govern from from okay. the center. Let's, let's go. Let's go quickly down some other people on the floor. You've been waiting patiently, sir. Please, here's a mic. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Husted. I'm the Ohio Secretary of State, and uh -huh. one of the circumstances that I have found in our democracy that doesn't seem to be working is the rigging of the system to the benefit of the political parties, namely redistricting. Uh, redistricting has led to far left and far right candidates because all they have to do is win the primaries. It would seem to me that a reform of that issue alone would go a long way in fixing what's going wrong in Congress. Uh, can I? Th thank you for that, and, and it gives me a chance to say something positive about my home state, <laughs> that we've also just recently changed our redistricting process. We've taken it out of the hands of the legislature and put it into the hands of a citizen commission. Uh, again, it remains to be seen just how effective this is going to be, but we have taken a significant really step in that direction. There's really an important experiment going on in California right now with yeah. respect to that and the primary reform. And, yeah. There's another question here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Post Citizens United, don't we now uh, have in effect government by aristocracy? Oligarchy. <laughs> yeah, but actually, if one is going to be candid, I think that was true pre Citizens United, that the Sheldon Adelson phenomenon has really nothing to do with Citizens United because he's writing personal checks, and what Citizens United dealt with was the ability of corporations 
to write money out of the corporate treasuries. Now, I think that one of the real evils of contemporary politics is that we don't have adequate disclosure rules. So we don't know how many corporations are in fact writing out big checks. But if one looks at this campaign season, what is really impressive slash depressing is the willingness of people to write these humongous checks in their personal accounts. And that's really independent of Citizens United. It goes back to Buckley versus Vallejo, which may be the worst single decision of the 20th century. Well, it actually goes back to this in case law history, as you know better than I do, even further to uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad case in the 1880s yes. that defined the corporation as entitled to the rights of a person. Yeah. Then you go back to the First mm -hmm. Amendment, that troublesome old poo, you can't restrict the rights of people to speak, and there you have a formula that uh, licenses all of this kind of uh, This is basically money. a friendly disagreement with your point. <laughs> There's a question here, please. Thanks. Uh, Andy Strauss. Um, the discussion has been pretty normative, sort of following the lines of uh, deliberative democracy. And I'm just curious what the panel thinks um, the ultimate threat of the delegitimization of the system is, whether or not the system can maintain itself, perhaps not, ide not ideally, but whether it can maintain itself if there's not a lot of faith in it, but simply that it is a system where various different vested interests can come together and get resolutions of their, of their differences, and that ultimately people don't need to believe in it all that much. Yeah, I think that there are a variety of pictures. One is more and more rule by oligarchy. Um, the other, I mean, my governor uh, flirted with the idea of secession, and then he brought, you know, he came back. But in fact, we did go through one experience with secession. Um, and in all semi seriousness, I've often wondered why Pacifica doesn't imagine itself as an independent country if it grows more and more disillusioned with Washington. What are the mystic cords of memory in Lincoln's language that bind us together? I mean, the great phenomenon of world politics uh, since 1969, you know, 1989, has been secessionism run riot. But I suspect that every single person in this room favors at least one secessionist movement somewhere, just as we all support the suppression of secessionist movements elsewhere. I happen to view the Southern argument on secession as a serious constitutional argument. Um, uh, of course, the war is about slavery. It was not about abstract theories of the Constitution. Uh, now, you know, I don't think that's a very likely uh, outcome, but disillusionment has its consequences. It led to the American Revolution. Yeah, I wonder if we get close on a note that possibly is, is hopeful, and that is uh, <laughs> possible. <laughs> I'll give it a try. Uh, it, it does strike me, and, and you find this, and you, you see this, I think, I would assume, on university campuses, because I see it, that there is a generation coming which is fed up with this kind of politics, which, is, which has no sympathy at all for the partisanship and the gridlock, and they very, very strongly committed to social change in the country. They do an enormous amount of effort. Now they go out in communities and, and nonprofits and other ways, but they're starting to have people now, military veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, who want to get into the system and are starting to run. And you're already seeing the early stages of this with Mark Warner from Virginia, for example, or Rob Portman from Ohio, Kelly Iot coming to the Senate from uh, New Hampshire. But that there's, a, there, there's a group here of young, of young people who are in graduate school now. We're trying to figure out how to get the younger generation engaged. How do you get more candidates to run? How do you fund it so you get a new type of candidate? And I see change coming from a generation that really rejects what, we're now, what we now have. And it's sort of part of the resilience of the country that we self-correct. That's been our strength over time. And I'm just sort of curious how you see this. Let me pick up on that and also you know, leadership yeah. statements, et cetera. If Barack Obama wins, which I think he still will, my prediction, um, I don't have a ranch to bet on it, and I, even if I did, I wouldn't bet the ranch, is that David Petraeus will be the Republican candidate in 2016 and will become the next president, 
because of faith in the military. Um, if you ask people in whom do they have trust, they don't have trust in Congress, they don't have trust in the presidency, they increasingly don't have trust in the United States Supreme Court, 94% have confidence in right. the military. Well, that's what uh, but history, history is not filled with yeah. a lot of encouraging examples about societies where the only institution that had right. any, tr in p which people had trust or confidence is the military. Uh, yeah, but what about, <laughs> makes me tell, tell me about these, this new generation as you see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish I could agree with you, and I certainly could name or think of individual students right. that I've had who fit the description you're talking yeah. about. But I, I worry a lot that the, <laughs> The, the delegitimation of government as an institution in our society, as characterized in that famous phrase of Ronald Reagan's about government is not the solution, government is the problem. That has gone just absolutely septic, and it's deep in the bloodstream of many people, young people in this generation. And I, I, I just I wish I could, but I can't yeah. quite share your optimism. Well, well I, 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 I'm, I'm awaiting, as EJ finishes up his, his book, I'm awaiting a new book by Joe Klein. Uh, on this point, he's gone out and interviewed a lot of these folks, and is and is more excited about this than anything else he's ever done in political coverage. But, but you have the last word. Yeah, I, I I I get very concerned about the fate of the republic. In response to Andy's question, the is, and any historian knows that the stability of any political order can never be taken for granted. And in and in the darkest moment of my pessimism, I walk into class and confront my students, and, and they disabuse me um, one by one of my, of my foreboding spirit and, and fill me really with optimism for... To, to, to unpack that just a little bit. Um, there, there, somehow, I mean, both at, at all the places I've taught, they, there's, um, there's a pragmatic um, devotion to common things that characterizes young people. Most of their public spiritedness now is channeled outside of formal politics and right. volunteer activities, but it has a concrete and, and real expression in their lives. And as they become the, the dominant group in the demographic, I don't think this country will get any worse, and I hope it won't get any less stable. Good. Well, on that note, thank you very, very much. <laughs>